Hello. Hey Noah, how are you? Good, how are you? Uh, I'm doing great. Well, it's really an honor being able to talk to you. Uh, thank you for taking the time to do this. And, you um, got it. So, yeah, yeah, let's get right to it. And uh, okay. so, when did you realize you wanted to be a sportscaster? You know, the, uh, the general answer I give is probably 13 or 14, but it might have been earlier than that. Uh, I actually grew up in uh, mid-Michigan in a rural part of the state, and uh, I was a Tiger fan. Uh, Ernie Harwell was, was kind of my hero. He was the longtime uh, radio broadcaster for the Tigers, and I played baseball, uh, and I was just okay at it, and so I realized that beyond high school, I, I probably uh, wouldn't be a baseball player, and I thought, being a broadcaster would be really fun to be at the ballpark every day and to, to talk about the game. So I would say right around the age you are right now, I think it really hit me that that's all I wanted to do and became my primary focus going into high school and then in college and then beyond that. And uh, fortunately, about mm, seven or eight years out of college I got my first shot at uh, doing big league baseball so it took a while but uh, in the end it was definitely worth it um so you mentioned the Tigers were your favorite team growing up what did that team mean to you well they were decent in the early 80s Sparky Anderson I think took over in 1979 um, but then they kept getting better and 1984 was was their big World Series year but I mean a lot of it I think you can relate to it is that you just kind of grow up in a certain area and the team uh, your family roots for in my case the, the team my dad uh, rooted for kind of became my team uh, and interestingly enough uh, when I was a kid the Tigers were only on television maybe three or four times a week. So I would say 60, 70 games were on TV. And actually the TV tandem uh, for the Tigers were a couple of Hall of Famers, uh, George Kell and uh, Al Kaline, who unfortunately passed away recently. Uh, so they were the TV duo, and I, I loved them too. Um, but I actually probably watched more Cubs and Braves games because the Cubs were on WGN every day and the, the Braves were on TBS uh, every night. So I, I was a big National League fan, even though, you know, for the most part, I, I rooted for the Tigers. Yeah, and then so what were some fit and challenges you had to face uh, to get to where you are now gr growing up? Well, I think the biggest challenge to start was because I, I grew up not near a big city was if I picked a college, I, I wanted to pick a place uh, that maybe gave me some opportunities to, to be around uh, some major league teams, some, some big major pro sports teams. So uh, I applied to Marquette University in Milwaukee and I fortunately got in and Milwaukee was this huge city to me at the time. And now that I, I've lived in Chicago for about 15 years. It doesn't seem quite as big, and I still love Milwaukee, but uh, at the time it was pretty overwhelming. But uh, my freshman year in college, I actually got an internship with the Milwaukee Bucks uh, of the NBA, and that was really instrumental in, in kind of getting me around uh, pro athletes. And so at that point, Noah, to be honest, it, it was all about experience and just trying to you know, do practice games and, and get in with the, uh, the student radio station and call basketball games. And uh, that, that was kind of my entire goal at the time. And I actually didn't even uh, major in broadcasting. I, I had a public relations major with a, a minor in history. And that was kind of my fallback option. But I, I still always had my eye on, on doing baseball. When I got out of college, I applied to just about every single and double A team uh, in the minor leagues. And I got a lot of rejection letters. I, I wish I had held on to them. I, I didn't, unfortunately. Uh, I didn't hear back from some, and uh, so I couldn't get a, a minor league baseball job. Fortunately, I got into local radio in Milwaukee, and that path ended up uh, becoming instrumental because uh, I got to cover the Brewers. I worked at the Brewers flagship station and got to know everybody with the team really well, and that was generally the way I 
kind of got in uh, to, to get a, a shot at doing big league games in 1999. But it, it took a long time for me to kind of earn their trust. Uh, I did a few minor league uh, innings uh, on weekends, a couple of summers just to get some tape. Uh, I know there's no tape anymore. It's all MP3s, but at the time it was literally uh, <coughs> audio cassette tapes that I uh, sent over to the Brewers, and uh, they thought I was okay and gave me a shot, and uh, I'm very fortunate for that opportunity. So when did you get to call your first um, Major League Baseball game? It would have been April of 1999. It was a, a Brewers-Pirates game in Pittsburgh. Uh, and I was filling in for Matt Baskersian, who was the TV voice of the Brewers at the time. And I think I did uh, 20 to 25 games or so uh, over the course of three seasons. And that was incredible for me, uh, giving me experience and exposure. And uh, one of the games I did probably in 2001, I kind of edited down into an hour and a half. And that became my demo tape. And that's how I... Got my job, my first full-time job with the Florida Marlins uh, in 2002, uh, and I worked there for three years, and then uh, got hired by the Cubs prior to 2005. But without that experience doing fill-in games in Milwaukee, I, I never would have had a shot at, at, at being a full-time announcer. Um, so did the Marlins win the World Series in 2002? Uh, 2003. Yeah, 2002 was my first year, uh, and it was actually the first year of the new ownership, Jeffrey Loria had owned the Montreal Expos. He sold the Expos to Major League Baseball. Uh, John Henry, who owned the Marlins, uh, sold the Marlins to Loria, and Henry bought the Boston Red Sox. So you had all this movement <clears throat> and ownership of, of three different franchises. So. Um, in 2002, there were a lot of holdovers from uh, the uh, Expos days with the Marlins. Uh, I think uh, that year we probably finished three or four games under 500. And then the following year just kind of got off to a bad start. Uh, Jeff Torborg was the manager. He got fired in May. They hired Jack McKeon. And right around that time, a couple of kids named Dontrell Willis and Miguel Cabrera made the Major League debuts. And uh, that team went on to win the World Series. They were not favored in any of the series in the postseason. Uh, the Giants, I think, had over 100 wins going into that series. Uh, they were down three games to one, as you know, against the Cubs in the NLCS. And they were heavy underdogs in the World Series against the Yankees, but uh, beat them in six games. Um, so what was it like to be a part of that journey and get to witness it? It was amazing. Uh, a team that, as I said, kind of didn't have a chip on their shoulder, but they knew that they were the underdog, and I think they relished uh, that. And, and when we think of the three teams uh, they played in that postseason, the Giants, the Cubs, and the Yankees, I mean, three enormous fan bases, three teams with tons of history. Uh, in the case of the Giants, uh, they had not won a World Series at that point in San Francisco. They would go on to do that in 2010, 12, and 14. Uh, but then the, the Cubs, we know about their World Series drought. Uh, the Yankees were a little bit different. They had uh, kind of been the dominant team in Major League Baseball for, for quite some time. But uh, that part of it was really fun to see a, a group of guys who were underdogs kind of surprise the world, so to speak. And now I look back on that team, and it really isn't that surprising they won. I mentioned Cabrera, yeah. who would be a first ballot Hall of Famer. Uh, the catcher was Pudge Rodriguez, who's in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Derek Lee was the first baseman. Who we know uh, of. <laughs> yeah, Luis Castillo, Alex Gonzalez were terrific double play combo. Mike Lowell uh, was the third baseman. Uh, they had a really good pitching staff. A.J. Burnett actually was hurt that year, but Brad Penny, Josh Beckett, Carl Pavano, uh, Mark Redman. I mean, it was a really impressive group when you look back and uh, – as surprising as it was that they won at the time, now that you look back on that, that period, Jeff Conine was a great uh, late-season acquisition, so it, it was a really underrated team. So the Cubs hired you in 2005. Uh, did you have any idea how what it would turn into? I mean, you've been their broadcaster for 15 seasons now. Well, I did know when I got the job that it would be 
in some ways very different uh, than the job I had in Florida, just just due to the big stage. Um, I'll never forget walking into Wrigley Field for the first home game in 2005, and everybody I saw said, hey, Len, how are you? And I didn't know who anybody was, so that kind of uh, took me back a little bit. Uh, in Florida, I was almost never recognized outside the ballpark. Um, so that was really, really cool and, and a bit overwhelming in a good way. Uh, but, you know, the job itself was pretty similar. Um, you know, I just tried to, to focus on the, on the work. And once the game started, it kind of felt like it had previously. And, you know, getting to work half my games at Wrigley Field was, was just something I could have never imagined. And I don't take it for granted to this day that I get to, to do all those games at the, the best ballpark in the country. But, uh, yeah, those first couple of years, you know, Bob Brindley and I were getting used to working with one another. And I think as much as anything, the fans were getting used to, to us as a tandem and our voices because they didn't know who we were prior to, to 2005. But the good thing about baseball is that you do it every day. And over the course of six months or so, people – tend to get used to your cadence and kind of your sense of humor and get to know you a little bit. So it took maybe two or three years before I think people got got comfortable with my style. So you got to see the full transform transformation of the Cubs in person. Uh, what was it like being there to, you know, when Theo Epstein took over to them winning the World Series in 2016? It was really neat. Uh, it kind of felt like you were watching something build from the ground floor up. Uh, 2012, 2013 were, were very tough on the field. But, you know, I, I looked at the big picture and, and I, I, I really embraced the idea that it was going to be this this step-by-step, -step, year year-by-year process. And, you know, I just remember who's Albert Almora Jr., who's uh, Kyle Schwarber, who's Chris Bryant. <laughs> uh, when Anthony Rizzo showed up, you know, I had heard his name. I, I know he made his debut with the Padres, but I didn't know anything about him. Uh, Jake Arrieta, man, I remember that name. What, what, what's he all about? Pedro Strope, Kyle Hendricks, you know, all these guys they acquired along the way, and then to see them grow, and then all of a sudden John Lester signs, and they get Joe Madden to be the manager. And 2015 was one of the most fun years I've ever had. That's kind of the underrated year. We all talk about 2016. Yeah. 2015, man, I mean, they, they won the wild card. They went in as the underdog and, and beat the Pirates in the wild card game, beat the Cardinals uh, in a playoff series, which was amazing. Uh, yes, it ended with a thud against the Mets, but I, I thought 2015 was, was a ton of fun. And, Without that year and kind of that postseason experience, I'm not sure 2016 would have happened the way it did. So I, I, I really, really enjoyed 2015 in particular. So did you see the 2015 breakout coming, or did it catch you off guard? It, that's a hard question to answer. I knew they would be really good at some point, uh, and I think with, with Madden, who immediately when he got hired, he said, I'm talking World Series right now. Um, I, I think it was within the realm of possibility, but I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, the Cubs went 71 and 91 the year before, maybe something like that, 20 yeah. games under 500. It's really hard to go from 20 games under to you know, 25, 26 games over, and they were able to do that, uh, which doesn't happen often. Actually, 97, they were 32 games over 500 that year, so the turnaround they made, it's not unprecedented, but it's really, really hard uh, to fathom. So, yeah, I thought they would be good, but I, I had no idea they would be, you know, 96, 97 win good. Um, so how do you prepare for a game? Um, you know, do you start a uh, day before, or when does it really start, and how does it build up to the actual broadcast? I think it's a combination. Uh, I'm always doing research. 365 days a year, just uh, freshening up my team and player files. So I usually have a page on each team with some general information. Um, I have also separate player profiles on, on each player and, and, and more information probably on starting pitchers uh, than any other types of players just because, you know, if you see uh, uh, Aaron Nola of the Phillies, he's going to be probably in the game for six or seven innings. So you have 
you know, a lot more time to talk about a, a starting pitcher generally than, than other players like relievers. Um, but I kind of try to freshen up those notes uh, throughout the year. And then uh, I tend to work one or two series ahead. So I think this week the Cubs were playing the Padres and the Phillies. Uh, so I would obviously have already kind of started reading the local articles probably late last week on the Padres. And then today is Wednesday, right? So the Phillies get here Friday. So I probably would have jumped into some Philly stuff Monday and you know, whoever we play next week, let's say it's the uh, Mets. I probably today or tomorrow would start reading some things on the Mets. So I, I would say five to seven days <clears throat> before a series, I start kind of figuring out what questions I have, general information about a team, what their injury situation is, uh, and then uh, kind of keeping up with the daily news and highlights uh, up until the series we play them. And uh, that's kind of my routine. And, uh, you know, I've streamlined it over the years. It's probably been uh, a little easier to prepare as you gather experience in the big leagues. Uh, but it works for me. Everybody's a little bit different, but uh, that's how I do it. Um, so you got to witness the 2016 World Series and the postseason. Um, but I really want to know, what was it like? Uh, did you go to Game 7? <clears throat> yes, uh, actually, I was uh, I was working in the uh, Cubs uh, radio booth uh, throughout that postseason. I did uh, some pregame interviews. I did play-by-play -play in the fifth inning. I uh, remember the wild pitch, the two runs scored. I called that. John Lester came into the game. Uh, I was behind the mic for that inning. Um, and then after the games, when the Cubs would win, I would do an interview in the dugout. Uh, so in the uh, seventh and eighth inning, I went down near the Cubs clubhouse and I was watching the, the monitor on TV and uh, they were wheeling in t-shirts and champagne and all kinds of stuff into the Cubs clubhouse. And then all of a sudden it, it, we were on a delay in the video. So you could hear the crowd reaction before the actual event happened on the screen. And I heard this big eruption and everybody cheered during a Rajay Davis event. And I thought, Oh, uh -oh what happened? And then of course the ball went into the stands and left and, Three seconds later, all the workers at the stadium with the T-shirts and the champagne, they wheel it out of the Cubs clubhouse and down toward the Cleveland clubhouse. I thought, oh, no, <laughs> it's happening, and I can't believe it. It was just one of those jaw-dropping, kick-to-the-gut moments. Then the, uh, the Cubs got through the ninth. The rain delay happened. I went up uh, back into the radio booth to uh, – just hang out, and all of a sudden, we're going to play. You know, it was a 17-minute delay, so we're right back down. Uh, I actually was allowed into the clubhouse and down near the, the Cubs' dugout. And all I could see as I looked up was, uh, I believe it was John Lester. He was uh, leaning on the rail. I couldn't see the field. I had my headphones on. I was listening to Pat and Ron, and uh, I heard the, the final out. And... Uh, and I walked up, got onto the field immediately, and uh, interviewed. My first interview was Justin Grimm. Uh, my second interview was Dexter Fowler. And uh, both guys actually cursed <laughs> on live radio. They were so excited and in the moment, but those things happen. Uh, eventually, we got a downpour of rain, but uh, by then I was in the clubhouse uh, celebrating with, uh, with all the broadcasters and the team. So it was, it was quite a night. I think we got home at about... 8.30, 9 o'clock the next morning. Wow. And uh, the parade was the day after that. And then I think I slept for about two straight weeks. <laughs> so um, what was the feel uh, during the – what was the feeling during the rain delay in, in the ballpark? Yeah, there were a lot of Cub fans there. What I had heard was a lot of uh, Indians fans sold their tickets for – tons of money to games six and seven and uh, a lot of fans there i guess paid for their season tickets the following year by by selling their tickets so there were at least you know 15 to twenty thousand cub fans in the ballpark which was was a really interesting scene um you know i don't recall the vibe during the rain delay uh in the ballpark just because it was so short i think if it had lasted a little longer i probably would have had more conversations but by the time i got up uh, to the press box. I think I may have literally walked in the radio booth, sat down, and then heard the press box announcement, you know, game will resume at 
you know, 1145 or whatever the time uh, was. And then I headed right back downstairs. So it was kind of all a whirlwind. And I just had these little snapshot memories. Um, but I don't specifically remember what the vibe was in the ballpark. I'm sure a lot of apprehension. Uh, consider the drama of a tie ball game, game seven, going into extra innings. <laughs> it, 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 it really, truly was one of the, the greatest baseball games ever played, considering the stakes, not just for the Cubs, but for the Indians. Uh, they still haven't won a World Series since 1948. Yeah, and then, so, they won the World Series. What was it like just being in the clubhouse for the celebration afterwards, and what are some of your favorite memories from the celebration? Well, I got a, a little uh, quiet time with Bill Murray. Uh, he and I chatted for a bit. Uh, Eddie Vedder was there. Um, you know, the players were just... It was like the fourth or fifth celebration uh, they had had in about a month's time because they clinched the division, uh, beat the Giants, uh, beat the Dodgers, beat the Indians. So, I mean, they had celebrated quite a bit, and every celebration actually got bigger than the one before it. Uh, all the families were there. It was great to see players with their wives and kids, uh, parents. Uh, the Cubs had a, you know, had a big, big group of people uh, who had chartered in, uh, who were separate from, from the, the, the player traveling party. And so it was just this massive uh, celebration and huge group of humanity in that clubhouse. Uh, I can't imagine how much time and uh, effort and money it, it cost to, to clean up that clubhouse <laughs> because there was champagne all over it. But uh, I'll never forget it. Um, so you got to be there when they, you know, the final out, um, what was like, just, what was it like? You were, you said you were in the dugout, like what was the feeling in the dugout when that happened and what was the scene like there? I mean, it was incredible. Um, you know, the thing is when you're working and you're broadcasting, uh, it does take a little of the emotion out of it because you have stuff you have to do. And if you, all you care about is, you know, the emotion, you're, you're kind of, you're not focusing on what you have to do. So my job right after the game was to stay in communication with the booth and grab a player and also try not to interfere with the celebration too much. Um, and I think that's why when I got Justin Brim and Dexter Fowler, I mean, they knew who I was. They were talking to me, but they were almost talking to me like we were just friends, even though I had a microphone, you know, in their face and, and, and they were just bubbling with emotion. So, you know, that, that's what I took away from it is just when players typically do interviews, they're, they're cognizant of the fact that they are on camera or, in this case, on the radio, and they're cautious. They don't want to say something that they're going to regret. Uh, but in that moment, there was no guard up. They just said whatever was on their mind at the time, and that, that's why the expletives got through. And again, I, I don't think anybody really uh, held anything against them for that. And uh, I kind of took it to mean that, uh, you know, they were comfortable in that moment. So uh, that, that, that was an interesting uh, thing. I'm, I'm sure I talked to Joe at some point and put his arm around him and, you know, got champagne all over myself. But that, that's, that's part of the fun being in the middle of it. Um, so what are some of your favorite moments you've gotten to witness as a broadcaster? Too many to remember, um, but I, I will say just uh, off the top of my head, the uh, the game in 2007 when Aramis Ramirez uh, hit the big home run to beat Milwaukee in June, that kind of was the first big moment uh, during the Lou Pinella era, uh, kind of propelled the Cubs to, to, to being the team to beat in 07 and 08. Uh, I think uh, the Carlos Zambrano no-hitter in Milwaukee against the Astros, in 2008, uh, Starlin Castro's major league debut, uh, during which he hit a three-run homer and a bases-loaded triple, knocked in six runs. Um, I want to say Jorge Soler hit a home run in his first at bat uh, in his major league debut as well. Jake Arrieta's second no-hitter I got to call in Cincinnati. Uh, Cole Hamels uh, no-hit the Cubs. In his yeah. final start with the Phillies, uh, was the first no hitter thrown at Wrigley Field since 1972. Uh, so those are just a few along the way. Chris Bryant's first big league home run in Milwaukee, his uh, big league debut a week or two before that. 
uh, all of those moments and everything Javier Baez does is probably a, a big highlight for me. Um, so what's it like getting to know those guys off the field and what are uh, some moments you get to share with them? Yeah, you know, it, 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 I, I do know all of them pretty well, uh, certainly professionally, some of them on a personal level uh, more than others. Uh, I, I do give them as much space as possible. We travel together. Uh, we see them a lot. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a balancing act. You don't want to get too close to the players. The other thing is, you know, when I started, uh, I was 31 years old, and there were some guys on the Marlins team who were, were basically my age, and we've stayed friends to this day. Um, but, you know, I'm old enough to be probably these guys' dad. You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm 20 years older than Rizzo. I'm you know, 25 years older than Bryant and Baez and all these guys. So, uh, you know, we get along well, but like, I kind of let them do their thing when we're on the road. Um, and then when we're in, at the ballpark, if I have a question, I, I make it quick, short, to the point. And, uh, you know, I think they respect the fact that I, I kind of give them space to do their thing. I'm, I'm probably more f friendly outside uh, the ballpark with the coaching staff and, and, you know, occasionally we'll maybe grab a bite to eat or, or grab a drink after the game, talk, talk some ball with those guys. But, you know, every once in a while a player will, uh, you know, we'll see him in the lobby or something and have a chat with him. But, um, you know, we're all in it together in, in a certain way. Um, but I also understand the pressure they, they're under to do their job and want to make sure they feel comfortable. Yeah. And then, so, off the field, um, what are some things you like to do? Well, we have three dogs, uh, so my, we uh, we like to hang out with them. They, they're they loving the fact that we're home the, the, the whole time right now. I don't think they'll understand when we have to get back to work, but uh, uh, I have a 19-year-old uh, son who's a freshman in college. He's back home right now, and so... Uh, you know, he and, and my wife and I are watching, uh, catching up on all the, the TV shows we uh, we miss. Uh, I like to go outside and try to get a, uh, a run in every day if I can. Uh, I uh, enjoy reading a lot, uh, baseball and non-baseball. Do a lot of audio books and listen to podcasts and uh, just try to, try to stay in shape mentally and physically uh, because you never know, all of a sudden the baseball season could start in a couple of weeks and I want to be ready to go. Um, so what are some things you're doing to keep in shape um, for the baseball season? Yeah, I mean, because we did like three weeks of spring training, um, I felt like we kind of got in a nice groove. So um, aside from just making sure uh, I'm not missing any big news, um, there isn't a whole lot of other preparation to do. I guess, you know, I'm just continuing to update my my player notes on, on some guys that i haven't seen in a couple of years but other than that you know there isn't a whole lot to do so i'm just kind of tapping the pencil on the desk and like waiting for that phone call to to find out how and when and where we're going to play so i saw you have a band and you've always been into music what does music mean to you yeah music's really important um that's the other thing i've been trying to do uh, with this downtime is is continue to, to try to get better at playing bass and guitar a little bit. Um, I tried to start writing some songs over the last few years. Uh, I'm not a young man anymore, Noah, and, uh, you know, there are a few gray hairs up here, so <laughs> trying to do a lot of the things that I uh, always wanted to do, and uh, there's just a point in your life when you decide it's either now or never. Uh, so, yeah, the music part is important and essential to, to my my happiness has become a, a, a real important hobby that has nothing to do with my day job. And I think as you get older, uh, you will, you know, find those things that, that, that make you comfortable, make you at ease with uh, the rest of the world and kind of make you forget about the things that, that are on your mind. So um, what are some advice you would give to young, um, you know, people who want to be in the broadcasting business like me? Uh, what are some advice you give to us? Well, I think you're off to a great start. I think um, trying to make connections with people who do what you want to do uh, is really important. Uh, the number one bit of advice is practice, practice, practice. Uh, every podcast you do like this, every interview, 
uh, every uh, practice play-by-play -play moment, uh, all of those things can only make you better. Uh, you will find as time goes on that to get really good at anything, and I think there's almost no exception to this rule, you have to do it a lot. And if you have a passion for it, and it's obvious that you do, uh, that should be pretty easy to do. Uh, I, I also think early on in your career, focus less on how many people can hear or see you and focus way more on the process uh, of actually doing it. Um, because as you gain more exposure and as more people see your work, you want that work to be at its best at all times. And sometimes, you know, you get a little ahead of yourself. And, I, hey, I was this way when I got out of college. If you had asked me, could you be a big league announcer right now? I would have said, absolutely. And I would have been not good at it. And I may not have lasted very long. So you want to make sure when you get those opportunities, you are best prepared and, and at your very best. And, you know, clean up some of the little mistakes and things that young broadcasters make. Uh, and, and, you know, once you learn those lessons, you just get a little incrementally better. And then you find your voice, you've got it, and you're ready to, to make that big leap. And then I have one more question before I have a would you rather set up. Um, so where did you, so your main call is, oh, baby, where did that come from? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Uh, I know um, Bob Cole had uh, used that a little bit. He's a longtime uh, Hockey Night in Canada voice. Um, and it probably just kind of happens naturally. Uh, I don't know if I used it before the Ramirez home run call or not, but um, yeah, that's one that I uh, like to drop in every once in a while. Um, it is it is one that I don't want to use too often um, and, and make it natural. Uh, I don't have a specific home run call per se, but yeah, I guess that's one I probably uh, dropped in there more more often than, than others. And that happens. You know, look, when you do this, as long as I have, you're going to find these little quirks and things that that you tend to repeat but uh, I really try to be in the moment every moment and make those calls as unique as possible for lack of a better word all right so to wrap up the interview here I have three would you rathers for you uh, so yeah let's get started with this so for one would you rather eat it uh, survive off of Italian food or Mexican food oh you picked my two favorites <laughs> I will go Mexican food just because guacamole is something I could probably eat every day. Um, number two, would you rather call a walk-off home run or a walk-off John Lester bunt? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I think the bunt just because I've called enough walk-off homers, but I, I like the bunt. Actually, that, that was a Sunday night game, so Pat got to call that one. Um, yeah. I was, uh, I was down on the field doing, uh, I don't know who I interviewed after the game, but um, so yeah, that, that would, I'd like to call the walk-off bunt. And then number three, would you rather play at Wrigley Field with your band to a sold-out crowd or the Cubs win another World Series? Oh, Cubs winning the World Series, for sure. Um, I've been very fortunate to, to play uh, music uh, at a lot of really cool places, and I'm not sure, going back to my previous comment about being ready for the moment, I'm not sure I'm quite ready for the moment of, being a musician in that setting. So I'll stick to my day job and I'll take a, another World Series ring in a heartbeat. All right. Well, thank you for doing this. I had a blast. And yeah, just thank you. All right. No, I have a question for you, if I may, here at the end. Can I ask right. you a question or two? Yeah. Uh, so if I could let you be the uh, fortune teller, so to speak, and uh, Noah is 28 years old. What is he doing for a living? What, what is your job when you're 28 years old? So about 15 years from now, what are you doing? Well, like you said, I practice this every day. I'm doing research like you. So I'm, I'm thinking announcer. And uh, you can get more specific. Would it just be a sports announcer? Would it be baseball? Would it be a specific team? I mean, if it's... You'd, you'd like to kick me out of the booth? I'm, you can be honest. Um, well, I mean, I want to announce for the Cubs. That's always been my dream. Uh, but I do other sports, too. I kind of think basketball is actually my 
best sport to call. I'm really good with baseball, though, because I've been doing that forever. Um, pretty good with football, but baseball and basketball are my two best sports. Uh, radio or television? Television, for sure. Okay. Um, yeah, television, uh, it, that's, uh, that's where all the, the big exposure is, right? Yeah. Everybody knows you on television when they see it. They go, hey, I know you. You look <laughs> familiar. Yeah. Uh, all right. Uh, one last question. Uh, all right. Let's do a would you rather. All right. All right. Let me think of a good would you rather. Would you rather see the Cubs win five more World Series in the next 10 years or you get an offer from the Chicago White Sox to be their television announcer 10 years from now. Oh, it's got to be the Cubs. I mean, die hard. You would, take, you would take a World Series for the Cubs over living your dream even with the other team in Chicago? I don't know. I mean, it's just the Cubs. I'm a diehard fan. Okay. And, uh, but, I mean, that that's pretty tempting with the <laughs> announcing thing, but... Uh, I mean, I live and breathe Cubs, so I, I'm going to have to go with that. Okay. All right. That's your honest answer. And you know what? That's a confident answer because it tells me that you don't need to take the job with the White Sox in 10 years. That you've got it covered. You're going to get to the big leagues at some point anyway. And the Cubs are going to win five World Series. Yes. So that's all good. Awesome. Thanks, Noah. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, have a nice day. All right, buddy. Stay in touch, okay? I will, for sure. Okay. I enjoyed it. Thanks. Bye -bye. I enjoyed it too. Bye.